I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... David Hahn, the Radioactive Boy Scout. Who was David Hahn? Well, he was a young boy growing up in the late 1980s who struggled in school and didn't seem to have any adults in his life that actually cared about him other than his adoring mother. After her life was forever changed by mental illness, David withdrew from the world and became obsessed with one specific thing, chemistry. He would spend the next decade of his life monastically dedicating himself to the craft of chemistry, teaching himself everything he could learn about the subject, and conducting thousands of extremely dangerous experiments in his various homemade laboratories. Eventually, after joining the Boy Scouts and learning about nuclear power while pursuing his Atomic Energy Merit Badge, he decided at 17 years old that he was going to build a working nuclear reactor in his backyard potting shed. Your boy Davy Bakes is back in the United States of America, so now we no longer have any crazy time differences or scheduling conflicts. It's time for Deep Cuts to get back to being the deepest of cuts. Act 1. Virginia is for lovers. Michigan is for obsessive freaks. On this show, we often mythologize the idea of obsession, of unwavering vision, the quiet, often intense dignity of never compromising. From our flagship Andrew WK episode to the heartbreaking accomplishments of Joshua Oppenheimer's act of killing. Even the tragic dedication of Andrew Carnegie letting his homegrown horror movie The Evil Within kill him or Laz Rojas letting his dream of becoming a famous actor drive him to homelessness. But what about the even darker side of obsessively committing yourself to the work? The stories that aren't told because the person's dedication ruined them, drove them into utter obscurity. What about when you go so deep into your passion that you drown and have nothing to show for it? What if it happened to a kid? And if even one adult in their life had shown a modicum of care or attention, it might have meant this kid becoming the most legendary figure of their generation. This is the story of David Hahn, the radioactive Boy Scout. David Hahn was born on October 30th, 1976 to Ken and Patty Hahn in suburban Detroit. Ken was a mechanical engineer at a General Motors subcontractor and Patty was a stay-at-home mom. Ken, consumed by the social mores of the bustling Detroit automobile industry and the dutiful working class culture it encouraged, was rarely home, getting up and leaving for work every morning at 6 a.m. before David was awake, and often not coming home until 6 p.m. or even after David had already gone to sleep. When he was home, his thoughts were with the robotic welding machines he built for the big auto plant assembly lines. Father and son rarely interacted, and when they did, it was extremely surface-level stuff. How was school? Good. You need me to change your diaper? Dad, I'm 10. David's mom, Patty, however, described by his father as a stunning beauty who once flirted with the idea of becoming a model but never had the drive to follow through with it, was obsessed with David. Her entire world revolved around doting on him, helping him with his homework the moment he got home from school, obeying his every childish whim, and bragging about him to anybody who would listen. David described his early years hanging out with his mom as some of the happiest of his life, and described Patty as the most wonderful person in the world. But during all this time, things weren't as they seemed to the blissfully unaware young David. In reality, his mother was silently struggling with the slow, creeping onset of mental illness. A few years after he was born, Patty started hearing voices and was diagnosed with chronic depression and paranoid schizophrenia. She thought that their house was haunted by ghosts and would constantly take David in her arms and check around the house to make sure there wasn't anybody hiding somewhere waiting to attack them. She frequently changed the locks on the house, afraid that someone was planning on kidnapping David. Eventually, she developed a debilitating drinking problem that ran in her family and would follow her for the rest of her life to cope with her struggling mental health. When David was four years old, her condition had gotten so bad that she was temporarily committed to a mental institution. Gone for months, this was the beginning of the end of David's idyllic, carefree childhood. He was racked with grief over the absence of his loving mother and felt abandoned. Even worse, in order to explain why Patty was gone, Ken told David that she had been in a bad car accident and was recovering from her injuries at the hospital, for some bizarre reason thinking that was a more comforting explanation than the truth. During this time, to cope with the absence of his mother, David would hide behind the living room couch 
couch and rock back and forth in silence. Can you imagine that? Like, I mean, put it, putting your putting yourself in the perspective of yourself as a kid and also like me thinking about my kids, like one of my sons is about to turn for. I can't even imagine what that would do to him if it was just like, oh, your mom just gone. She's going to be gone for like six months. And like not only that, but like telling him that she was like in a car accident and was like fighting for her life in a hospital somewhere. Like, that's fucking traumatizing. Yeah, it's really traumatizing. And it it just seems like even a like you're saying, like the worst possible thing you could do at that point. Like, hey, uh, you know, your mom who you love so much. Well, she's in physical agony right now. She has multiple broken bones and she's just like kind of on the verge of death. Yeah, but it was just like that was preferable to somebody over the stigma of being like your mom is having is like in a mental institution and she's dealing with like mental health problems like especially especially like in the past is it's like it's like so taboo that he would rather tell that to his son than the truth which is like still very upsetting but not as like horrifying as like oh my god she's gonna fucking die yeah, it's I mean, mark this as uh, check number one on the if only people had been cool and like chill and cared about David and like maybe we're honest with him. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's funny you say that because I, I, I don't even think I really thought about that. But this really is like really emblematic of the larger scale problem that we're going to talk about throughout this episode, which is that, you know, Ken told David that his mom was in a car accident cl- it, it, clearly because the idea of talking about her struggling with mental illness is like embarrassing or socially unacceptable or a taboo thing to talk about for a lot of people, especially, you know, in years past. And so, you know, at this pivotal developmental moment in David's life when he was four years old, Kim would rather have deeply traumatized him than had like a real emotional conversation with him. How do you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that would be a difficult conversation to have with a four year old in in general. But like, how would you go about that now? Like, would you try and explain what schizophrenia is? Did he know that she had schizophrenia at this point? Like, yeah, I think she was she was diagnosed already. I don't know. Honestly, I'm going to be honest and say I don't necessarily know the right answer because I hope that I never have to do this. Um, But. I don't know if it's necessarily saying like, oh, your mom is in a mental institution and she has schizophrenia. This is what schizophrenia is. Maybe it's that. I don't know. Maybe that's the right. Maybe that you literally just are fully honest with your four year old child. I I don't actually know if that's the right way to to go about it. Um, I think it's maybe more something like just saying like, oh, you know, your mom has been going through some some issues and she's been feeling sad lately and she needs to go talk to a doctor and have some of these feelings that she's had, she's having looked at and sort of discuss them with a doctor and figure out if she can figure out how to make some of those feelings a little bit better. Something like that. I think that's my best knee jerk reaction of how I would handle it. But I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe you just tell them. Not, not really sure. Wait, so how are you going to tell me when 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 my when my mom has to leave and you have to sit me down and say, well, Davy boy, your mom has schizophrenia. How are you, are you not going to tell me that she's like in a fucking hospital because of car wreck, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just show you like f- footage of a horrible car wreck and just say, I got this on camera, Dave. It's really bad. I think that's her foot. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay, good. Glad we got that sorted out. Okay. After several months, Patty eventually returned to the Han household and it was a glorious reunion for David, but things were never quite the same. Her schizophrenia was only deepening and the antipsychotic medication she was prescribed just made her near catatonic. She still loved and cared for David and to the best of her ability pampered him with affection, but for the most part, she just sat around the house in a hypnotic state, listening to the radio or watching TV. David, who once had a full life of fun and love with daily activities and more attention than he knew what to do with, was now alone. A mode of existence that would recalibrate the trajectory of his life and define his legacy. Alone, in his room, with nothing or nobody to bounce off of, reverberated out into infinity. David filled the vacuum in his life left by his mom with imaginary worlds. He spent his days occupying himself, developing elaborate imaginary scenarios and universes of pretend play in his bedroom. He also became obsessed with Spider-Man and fantasized about being bitten by a radio active spider and given the power to climb up walls and lift several times his own weight. In his own mind, he was Peter Parker, and all he needed was that radioactive bite to lift him out of obscurity and thrust him into greatness. I think this was like, I think the reason, and we're definitely going to talk about this a lot more in this episode, but I think the reason why this story has resonated so strongly with me, and maybe I'm jumping the, jumping the gun talking about this, and I'm certainly interested in hearing your thoughts on all this stuff. 
But uh, we do episodes, I think, that you or I or some combination of the both of us, we tend to like really relate to the the person in, in the episode, it's aspects of their life or their struggles or just their thought process. And this is a situation where it's very similar to that, but it's like David Hahn is like, this is me in like a, in a, with like a, a, a half flap of the butterfly's wings where like I grew up having all of these interests and obsessions and, th- and things that I was like fixated on. But if like just nobody gave a shit and like this is what happens when you are a, a, a child who has like a very robust imagination or you have these things that you become really passionate about wanting to do. And th- but if like you have zero support system, which I thankfully did to some degree, much better than what 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 David had. And I think that's the thing that resonates with me so strongly about this is just like seeing like, oh, my God, like this is what would happen if like just nobody gave a shit about a kid. Yeah. In some ways, I kind of feel like, you know, there's obviously core themes to the show at this point, Um, you know, uh, aspiration, you know, whether that be creative or personal, you know, the you know, I think we've said on the show before fueled by attempt multiple times. Uh, That's one core thematic underpinning to the show. Kayfabe and how individuals mask their insecurity or project um, a, a greater sense of self in order to accomplish some broader goal through a an architecture that's artificially created to emphasize or de-emphasize one aspect of their personality is another. Um, and I feel like both of those are interlaced in this story intrinsically. However, they're the mirror universe of what they usually manifest on our show. They're usually, even if it's a negative manifestation of kayfabe, it's it's you and me discussing, look how this person manipulated everyone. Isn't this fascinating or isn't this interested? Inter- isn't this interesting how this person maneuvered these situations to get X, Y, or Z results? And they usually, usually the themes of the show have some kind of social ramifications, whether that be creative and trying to influence through people through art or political uh, ramifications or just interpersonal relationships deteriorating or being born out of these kind of constructed elements. And specifically in this episode, as you'll see as we go on, God damn, it's it just gets so dark. And all, all those themes are there in one way or another, but just mutated in a way that we don't normally attach. Yeah, it's just like it's like th- all of those themes just in a vacuum and and the the logical conclusion effects of those things playing out in a vacuum in a very, very, very dark way. Throughout these years, though, Ken and Patty's marriage was slowly crumbling. Patty, hardly any better than she was before going into the mental institution and constantly medicated, completely stopped working or even looking for a job. With only one working class income, the Hans fell into financial dire straits, which caused tension between the couple and increased fighting. David would sit in his room, peering out into the living room as his parents screamed at each other, and Patty, the one with the temper, would hurl objects at Ken from across the room. By the time David was nine years old, the Han family was officially broken. Ken and Patty got a divorce and moved out of David's childhood home. And worst of all, considering their previous attachment and the fact that Ken had always been a barely their father consumed with his work, Patty lost custody of David due to her previous history with mental illness, and he instead went to live with his dad. Shortly after the divorce, Ken started dating a fellow GM engineer named Kathy, and after a year, they moved in together to a house in the Detroit suburb of Clinton Township. David suddenly had a new stepmom as well as an older sister, Kathy's daughter, Christina, but things didn't really change for him. His dad still worked long hours at the GM plant, rarely crossing paths with David during his waking hours, let alone spending any quality time with him. Christina wanted nothing to do with him, thinking him to be weird. And Kathy, though she tried her best to step in for Patty and become David's matronly figure, had trouble connecting with him. Most nights in the Han household 2.0 consisted of Kathy and Christina eating dinner in the living room so they could watch TV, while David ate in his bedroom and read books. On weekends, however, David got to stay with his mom in the nearby suburbs of Commerce Township. She'd moved there with her new boyfriend, Michael, a retired GM forklift driver, and offered a brief respite for David from the dull, disconnected daily life in his father's house. Michael and Patty were more fun, and Michael made a stronger effort to connect with David than Kathy did. In fact, they both shared a love for fireworks, often heading out to hiking trails to set off cherry bombs and other mini explosions together while Patty would set up camp and cook burgers for them. 
But things weren't exactly ideal in Commerce Township either. Patty still deeply struggled with her alcoholism and mental illness, and Michael was also somewhat of a heavy drinker. So over the years, David began to drift further and further from his family, instead making friends at school and spending his times out on the basketball court or riding bikes across the landscape of 1980s suburban Detroit. In fact, as David began to get older, it almost seemed as if his life would even out and become somewhat normal after all. He was no longer alone and isolated. He had friends. He did normal kid stuff. He was getting to the age where he didn't want to be around his parents all the time anyway. Maybe there was hope for this kid yet. All right, so so uh, what, what are we looking at here, Dave? We got this picture of of uh, our poor our poor boy David Hahn. I didn't want to say our boy because it's just it's too the story's too dark to even be that let have that much levity to it to it to it. Uh, so this is a this is a photo of David Hahn. And it's a candid photo that someone's taken of him at night. He's wearing a Boy Scouts uniform. He's got his Boy Scout sh- uh, sash across his chest with a bunch, uh, bunch of patches on it. Um, you know, he's a kind of dorky looking white guy with a somewhat broken nose, it looks like. Um, blue eyes, blonde hair, thin face. Um, a very uh, gummy smile. Um, he's got kind of small teeth and but large gums in the way that a, a kind of stereotypical nerd guy might. And he's obviously in the middle of kind of saying something to the guy holding the camera that's kind of like, ah, oh, come on. Because he's got this kind of like, uh, you know, uh, g- g- grin grin on his face that's very uh, nonchalant. And he's raising his right hand uh, and he's kind of like motioning away like, a, come on, hey, come on, man. Uh, don't take that fucking photo type of expression. Dang, man. I said describe the photo, not fucking roast him. <laughs> this is this is a fucking, this is the, what is it? Uh, the syllable and brains episode all over again. Yeah, you know, he's just like, he's, he's wearing his boys out of uniform. He looks like a total piece of shit. He's, <laughs> he's the fucking shittiest looking guy I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's not what I said. That's not what I said. I was just trying to paint a picture of him. <laughs> he's a fucking dork. I mean, the, the interesting thing about this guy is that there was a dude named Richard on my uh, junior high basketball team who looked almost exactly like David Hahn. Like, he was the small forward on that team. He was the starting small forward. And he looked very similar to this dude, which is real weird. Well, he's got he's one of the, he's got one of those faces that's like very it's like a very specific category of face that you've seen a lot. Like, like I, I can't think of a specific example but I look at David Hahn as a kid and I'm just like, I've seen this guy multiple times. Nerdy, nerdy Irish dude. <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah, the, I, if you see pictures of him, um, it does look like his nose has been broken. It's a little crooked um, in in all the pictures of him. But there's nothing that... There's nothing in the research that showed that he ever broke his nose or whatever, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he did because he like was like a rambunctious kid who got into a lot of like hijinks like he would get he would like do crazy stuff. So I I actually wouldn't be surprised if he had broken his nose, but it doesn't it doesn't say anything about that. Um, And also another thing about that is there's like just surprisingly no media around this story. Um, there's some photos of him that were taken uh, in, we'll, we'll talk about this later on, but uh, a, a book was written about David Hahn called The Radioactive Boy Scout um, by Ken Silverstein, which is like the source for most of the information from this story that anybody has, where he basically spent a while like interviewing all these people and writing this sort of oral history of David's life. And uh, there's there's pictures that were taken from whenever he was with him. But aside from that, there's nothing. There's no there's no pictures. There's no videos. There's no interviews. Um, he was never on camera. That's kind of a shocking accomplishment in the contemporary world. Yeah, I mean, this whole thing takes place in like the early to mid '90s, and uh, there's just no photos of him on the internet. There's there's th- there's three pictures, which we'll look at later. I mean, including this one. There's this picture of him in his Boy Scout uniform. There's a picture of him standing outside of his la- his makeshift laboratory, which we'll get to. And then there's a picture of the EPA, spoiler alert, but there's a picture of the EPA inspecting his laboratory. And that's it. There's no other photos that exist. And then the other pictures are like stuff from the mid 2000s, whenever Ken Silverstein was interviewing him. But other than that, there's nothing. It's it's, it's pretty crazy. But even during this time, David started exhibiting some early signs of strange behavior, that which simultaneously alluded to the early traumas of his childhood growing up with the volatile relationship of his mother and father and the ensuing breakdown of his family unit, 
as well as foreshadowed things to come in the future. David was frequently caught letting the air out of people's tires, and once started a fire in the woods that got so bad, the fire department had to be called. It was also during these years, though, that David found a passion for taking things apart. Anything electronic or with moving parts he could get his hands on, he'd take it apart, figure out how it worked, and put it back together again. In fact, right alongside his more destructive behavior, he also showed early signs of promise. He was constantly trying to come up with new inventions, and once created a motorized skateboard, by attaching an electronic motor to a store-bought skateboard and rigging the motor to be controlled by a handheld joystick. The motor-powered skateboard went on to become an invention that became massively popular for a time in the late 80s and then experienced a resurgence again in the 2010s with products like Boosted Board and One Wheel. And all those years ago, as a kid, David was the first one to do it. This this part really, this, this detail really struck me um, because... Because you're a huge fan of Casey Neistat, and anytime he was on one of those fucking boosted boards running through New York, you're just like, it was David Hahn, he got robbed! I mean, you, you, you say that as a joke, but I wish I was somebody who had the, like the carefree nature to just go like f- zooming around New York City on a boosted board. Like, I could never do that. Especially like vlogging. Like, because the Casey Neistat will show outtakes sometimes where he just fucking falls and like almost gets hit by cars and shit. I could never do that. The whole time I'd be like, I'm going to die. I could, I couldn't, I, I, I have too much inward self-awareness to, to be able to do something like that. But yeah, I, I could, ne- I could, I could never do that. And I, and I, 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 I watch those videos and I'm just like, man, I wish I could, I wish I could just like, I wish I just had that vibe just riding around on a fucking motorized skateboard. Casey Neistat, more like Casey nice stat. Am I right? Yes, exactly. But, but yeah, like, uh, the, Because the thing about this is like, it can sometimes be exaggerated. Like, oh, this, like, (laughs) there's this, there's this podcast called uh, Darknet Diaries. And there's a lot of stories on it that are very kind of oddly similar to this. But it's in the world of like hacking and data security, where like, there's these kids, there's stories about kids who like, as teenagers, as 15, 16 year olds, they got really into like hacking and, uh, you know, like white hat internet lore about being a hacker and all this stuff like that. And then they would like do something like hack into their school's network or whatever. And they would get in huge trouble. They would get arrested and the FBI would come. And the, all these stories are like they kind of go in one way or the other where like either it kind of ruins the kid's life and they go to prison and then they get out like in their mid 20s and their just whole life is upended. Or it's like the opposite where like somebody know like sees the potential and is like oh like you you know we could actually like use you and like give you a job and all this stuff but a lot of the stories are like they're not really hackers like they just kind of like knew some basic stuff about how to like guess a password and then they just got into huge trouble and the fucking FBI came and arrested them but they're not really they're not like actual like mega genius kids or whatever but in David's case as we'll get into he like legitimately was like a, a savant of like uh like mechanical things, like figuring out how things work and the components of them and then like having the imagination to think of combinations of ways to put them together to create new things. And that'll become more and more apparent as we go on. But he like as a as a kid, as like a as like a, a 12 or 13 year old kid, he just had the idea of like, oh, like you could put a motor on a skateboard and then you and then you could like use a controller. And then like that became a real thing that somebody invented and it and made millions of dollars from it. Like shortly afterwards, like a couple of years after David did it, somebody became a millionaire because of that idea. And that's crazy. Like my kids aren't this old yet, but if if one of my sons was 14 years old and they created something the equivalent of that today, I would be like, holy fucking shit. It would blow my mind. But nobody cared. Nobody was paying attention at all. I mean, that's kind of the that's kind of the undercurrent of this whole thing, right? Nobody's paying attention. Yeah, it's just it's just wild to me. And there's there's a couple other there's like literally a couple other instances in the rest of the story where he like simultaneously invents something alongside somebody else who also invents it and gets, you know, credit for it and makes money from it or it becomes a real product. It, it, like This isn't the only time this happens. But his budding career as an inventor was doomed to fail once he discovered the obsession that would go on to consume him for the next several years of his life, chemistry. You see, all the while throughout David's ups and downs, his struggling home life, his bouts of destructive behavior, his flights of imaginary fancy alone in his bedroom, or even his impressive accomplishments as a wonderkind inventor. There was one constant. Nobody gave a fuck. Not a single adult in his life 
took interest in anything he was doing, all except one. Oddly enough, it was Kathy, his stepmom's father, John Sims, that took notice of David's talents and decided to help him along in his passions. And that's why one year as a gift, he gave David the Golden Book of Chemistry, a massive tome chock full of descriptions of different chemical compounds and their effects on each other, as well as hundreds of science experiments that could be conducted in the home using basic household items. David instantly fell in love with the book, poring over and memorizing its wealth of knowledge of the world of organic chemistry. The only problem? The book was actually published in 1960, and its plethora of home science experiments weren't exactly safe. With a combination of pre-Cold War optimism and lack of modern safety regulation, the Golden Book of Chemistry and its included experiments made any present-day science books for children look like a book on how to nap during a pillow fight in the public library. The book had kids mixing real chemicals together to get explosive reactions, and explained in great detail how to extract radioactive material from common items such as old-fashioned clocks and smoke detectors. David's largest takeaway from the Golden Book, however, was its unbridled optimism about a future powered by nuclear energy. Because the book had been written and published long before nuclear power became a looming apocalyptic threat on the horizon in modern American life, it leaned hard into the narrative that nuclear energy was going to transform the world into a utopia free of the modern woes of energy scarcity, hunger, and poverty. And he bought into the narrative written in this antiquated book hard because he was a kid and didn't realize the book was like super old and outdated. In David's mind, the inevitable nuclear renaissance was going to solve all of his family's problems. Maybe if they didn't have to worry about things like money, which is what ultimately broke his parents up, then they could all be happier. Nobody would fight anymore. Who knows? Maybe it could help his mom get over her drinking problem and struggles with mental health. As David read over each anachronistically optimistic word about nuclear power written in the Golden Book, his heart and mind were filled with hope. A hope he'd cling on to forever. He had no idea he was investing his entire soul into the lost remnants of a broken dream. This is the part where, like, I think I think reading reading this story and just kind of learning about David as we will more and more as, as this episode goes on, I think one of the more confounding things, even for me, like I I understand hyper fixating and getting obsessed with with something. But even in that context, just to see how he for years was just committed to this sole idea of chemistry, just vaguely chemistry. It's not even that wasn't even pointed. It wasn't like, oh, I want to do this specific thing. He just was obsessed with chemistry. And even from somebody who can understand like getting really obsessed and hyper fixated with something, it's still like crazy to me that he was so obsessed with this thing, this very kind of like broad idea of like, I just want to do chemistry. But this is the part that illuminates that a little bit and makes it it makes it more understandable of like how he could have committed to this so thoroughly. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the idea was like, there's this form of control in this world where like nothing is in my control. My life started out really good. And then it just kind of like it just went off the rails, like out of nowhere and just never went back. This idea of like, oh, but in chemistry, like I can I can control these things and there's mathematical equations. And if you add this much to this much, it just works out and it's going to happen. And this chemical reaction is going to take place. Um, and maybe if I can figure out a way of making those chemical reactions, you know, work within the parameters that are dependable, I can figure out some kind of solution that will fix things and make all these other chaotic things go away and become better, you know. And and also just the specifics of um, the power of retrofuturistic optimism, right? Like the the, the kind of like quintessential Star Trek 1960s, like the future will be better. It will be better. It's not that it could be if we, you know, work hard enough and come together as, a, a, you know, a global culture. It's like, no, 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 no. It's predestined. The earth is going to solve all of its problems. It's just going to be better. And for that to be filtered down into the, the kind of individual's brain of like, oh, it will be better and it'll be better because of nuclear power, which feeds directly into what you're talking about of this idea of kind of oh, I love chemistry because it's math and because it's certain and because everything in my life is so unstable that that the the kind of emotional pipeline between because when you hear this story on the surface of like this kid built a nuclear reactor in his uh, garage or whatever, like you think of that as almost like a a dark thing. You think of it as like almost kind of, you know, an Oklahoma City bombing situation or something. He's like a, a, a terrorist, basically, which is kind of as we'll find out kind of what they were thinking. But yeah, it's not that at all. Yeah, which is actually very 
as hard as it is to relate to somebody who's going to do all the things he's about to do in the way that he does them, it's it's it really grounds it in, a, in an emotional life that is needing, you know, and wants to connect and help people, which is not what this story appears on its surface. Yeah. And in just going back to what we talked about before, where it's like this is the dark version of the story that we talk about a lot. It's similar to that. It's similar to other stories we've discussed in in those ways. Like I see shades of the Napster story and kind of what I was so fascinated about with that, which was this idea of like, I am struggling to connect with the world. I'm very good at this one thing, which is like coding. Maybe I can figure out a way to use my skill to get friends, basically. And it, But in this case, it was like, maybe I can use my skill to like cure global energy deficiencies. <laughs> And, and by the transitive property, like, solve these domestic problems that cause my family to implode. He also learned about Marie and Pierre Curie, the godmother and father of nuclear science, in the pages of the Golden Book. And from that point on, they became his heroes, and he wanted to follow in their footsteps. He became determined to be the next great name in the nuclear field, and to one day revolutionize the world. But he had a lot of work, and a lot of experiments to do first. Also, I feel like this is like a total off-topic aside, but it's just like there's never going to be any other opportunity to mention this. Uh, a friend of mine um, who, who I used to work with, um, she is related to M Marie Curie and she had, she has, uh, she, she has, so one time years ago, she tweeted this tweet and basically what happened was one time she mentioned to a guy that she was on a date with, I think maybe, or maybe it was just a guy. I don't remember the context of it, but she mentioned to a guy that she was related to Marie Curie and the guy said, it's pronounced Mariah Carey. <laughs> This is, this is this is my friend Eileen. I don't think she'd care if I said her last name, but I won't say her last name. Come on, Eileen, tell us your genie jeans. Are you related to Marie Curie? But she she tweeted this. She tweeted that she, this happened, and this tweet went mega viral. And like Mariah Carey retweeted it, and then like they talked. Like at one point, they were like DMing each other. And like, you've probably seen this tweet because it's like in every like Buzzfeed, like funniest tweets of the week list. Like this tweet just like went fucking nuclear to borrow a theme. Um, but it's very funny. It's very funny that that happened to her. It's like one of the biggest like examples of Dunning-Kruger I've ever heard. And deservedly so, that tweet she posted about it is like one of the biggest tweets on Twitter. After reading and rereading the Golden Book, David set up his very first laboratory in the bedroom of his father's house in Clinton Township. He used every cent he had to buy up supplies for conducting experiments, including actual chemicals such as sodium hydroxide, potassium nitrate, sodium nitrate, ammonia, sulfur, and magnesium. Using the pages of the Golden Book, he started combining these materials to get different kinds of chemical reactions and slowly build an understanding of what types of effects he could get with different chemicals and how they could be combined and manipulated to create new and exciting things. Another thing that you need to keep in mind about this as uh, now and as we read about his exploits is like this would be this would be crazy to do even now like attaining all these chemicals as a, as like a as a 14 year old kid and mixing them in your house and causing these explosions and fucking around with like nuclear radiation and all this stuff but this happened in the late 80s and early 90s and he was just like ordering this shit through the mail. This wasn't like, this wasn't no fucking Amazon Prime free two day shipping bullshit. This was like tracking down chemical companies in the phone book and like, and like mailing in for like a request form and then filling out a form and sending it back and waiting eight weeks to get a like a little jar of some kind of chemical. Like this is some crazy shit. I kind of like that though. I kind of, I kind of like the fact that it's this weird, almost like a contemporary wizard going out and like harvesting, you know, frog's legs from the, the path of Gilgamesh, you know, like. It really is that too. It's like straight up that, like the, the, the hoops he had to jump through as we'll get into. And like the thing that the story as I, I'm assuming as we're kind of reading through it is not going to convey because I, it's, it's crafted to be engaging and kind of get through the, the important parts or whatever, but the sheer amount of patience and just waiting that this kid had to do for all this shit to show up that he was ordering and tracking down. The thing that, that um, the thing that's interesting to me about it is that 
that also feels thematically linked to what's happening because he has all of this space in his life, you know, an absence of connection and the the idea that so much of the process of making this couldn't have been accomplished by someone with an active for unfortunately an active or filled social life or connection with other people like it takes someone on the fringe that has this level of empty bandwidth to really procure these items and d dedicate the brain space to doing this you know and that was the way he was able to do it basically aside from what you're saying of having the time but the reason why he got away with people sending them these things these things first of all whenever he would like request things that a person shouldn't legally ha be allowed to have and the reason why nobody was suspicious of him or took notice of it or was like what the fuck is going on or like maybe he's doing something really dangerous is because nobody, this has never happened. Nobody has ever had the time and the focus to just do any of this shit. So nobody saw it coming. Nobody ever suspected what he was doing because nobody was ever like, yeah, this 14 year old kid is like fucking waiting like eight weeks, slowly amassing chemicals and then like patiently reading through textbooks to like figure out how to as assemble them into a nuclear reactor. It just, nobody even, nobody even fathomed that this would be a thing that could happen. And because David was a kid with very little prior knowledge of any of these chemicals, and the book he was using was written like it was from the perspective of a dude who just wanted a bunch of children to die in freak accidents across the country, David seemed to have zero concept of the danger he was often putting himself in. Such as the time he, with the guidance of the Golden Book, just casually concocted homemade chloroform in his bedroom. For that experiment, the Golden Book recommended that the reader sniff the forbidden elixir to get a sense of its complex aroma. But David sniffed a little too much and essentially ended up roofing himself, waking up on the floor of his bedroom minutes later, having no idea what happened to him. One time when I was like, when I was like a teenager, older than, no, no, it was like around this time, I was trying to change out the RAM on my computer. Um, and the computer was off, but I didn't think to unplug it. And I touched this component on the computer inside of the PC tower and it zapped me and knocked me unconscious. And I just like woke up in a haze, like however many minutes later, like what the fuck just happened? Did you gain superpowers? Is that where you became RAM man? Yeah, now I, now I can like, phase into the power grid and like go to your house and watch you. Jerk Are you off. the lawnmower man? Yeah, I am the lawnmower man. Fucking hanging out in a weird shitty 90s VR world with Pierce Brosnan. David's growing obsession eventually got too big for him to afford on his meager earnings of lunch money and occasional allowance. And so he started the Big D Lawn Service, a lawn mowing business he exclusively used to earn funds to buy new chemicals and lab equipment. And though his social life had started to flourish in recent years, all of that completely went away. He was a scientist now. Now, any invitation to go hang out with friends, shoot hoops on the basketball court, or go to the movies was now flatly declined. Instead, David started spending his days that he wasn't in his lab, knocking himself out with 18th century anesthetic at the local public library, poring over dozens of chemistry books, absorbing the wealth of knowledge that his beloved golden book had only scratched the surface of. And by the way, I, I, I think, you know, now, now that he's not using it anymore, I think Big D, like, I think you should use that. <laughs> <laughs> the big D, uh, big D lawn mowing service. I should just start <laughs> like I should start a kid's lawn mowing service like after school thing. But as an adult man, I was just going to say like big D comics or something like that. But yeah, like you should start a lawn mowing service to earn some extra cash. I'm doing it next weekend. David also obsessively read Ken's science textbooks from his college days, which impressed his father. But it also began the complicated dynamic between the two that would continue for years and end up causing a lot of problems for David as well as his entire family. David learned little tricks to appease his dad and keep him from asking too many questions. As long as Ken was busy fawning over David being a chip off the old block, taking interest in the subjects that Ken had focused on in his college years, he was too distracted to notice the extremely dangerous experiments with volatile chemicals that were going on under his own roof on a daily basis. And David got really good at pulling the wool over his dad's eyes. David obsessively soaked up knowledge about chemistry like a sponge, but it wasn't good enough for him. He felt the limitations of his own ability to learn and started to become obsessed with pseudoscientific methods for boosting his mental capacity for memorization, such as blending up putrid mushroom smoothies to try and increase his memorization, and also ordering herbal brain health supplements like ginkgo biloba. I know this is going to sound really weird, and I don't know if this is something you're going to expect, but I really relate to this. This part right here. Whenever I was a kid, like younger up and into high school, 
I was really worried about very, I was worried. I mean, I was really worried that I, about dying. I, I, I did not want to die. I was really concerned about not wanting to die and I didn't want to die young. And I was also like really freaked out about the idea of like only having like a life expectancy of like 85 to maybe a hundred years. And I was like really into the idea of like trying to figure out how to live longer. And so I would like stay up and watch these like weird, like pharmaceutical infomercials that would come on at like one in the morning. And they would have these things where they're like, there'd be a guy and he'd be like, there's this, there's this specific village in, uh, in like the, in like the Pacific islands and the people of this village for years, scientists didn't know what was going on, but they would live until they were 110. And they would at, at, at the age of like 90, they would look like they were 40 and scientists just couldn't figure out why this was happening. And then they figured out that it was because they were drinking water enriched by this coral reef that was, you know, off of this island. And so we took this coral reef and we made it into this supplement and it was called coral calcium. And it was just these pills that were supposed to like make you stay young and like live longer. And I actually had my mom order these for me and I took them. You were like, you were like a 70 year old man being like, I, I'm, I can see the end. I must get these. And then turn to your mother and we're like, mom, like your inner monologue was like, hey, excuse me, mom. But then the voice like, mom, can you order these off the TV for me? Absolutely. That's 100 percent what it was. And I also I also was kind of like also it wasn't memory, but like I was kind of like freaked out about like Alzheimer's or just like losing control of my mental faculties. So I also I also took ginkgo biloba for a while as well. How when did that change? When did you stop doing that? Um, whenever I got like a little older and realized that all those things were just like scams, like that was that, that was the thing is like because I was like I was like they figured it out. Like they figured out that this fucking supplement makes you live longer and stay younger. Like why isn't anybody everybody doing this? And then eventually when I got a little older in high school, I started getting interested in learning about, I mean, I was, got smarter obviously, but I also started getting interested in learning about like misinformation and how people like say things that aren't true. And I just basically was like, oh, this is all just bullshit. Like they just, they just hawk these shitty supplements on late night TV and they're not, they don't, they don't, they're not actually legit. Interesting. I wonder what that turning point for you was. Like you're like watching like the slap chop guy. You're like, wait a minute. And then you turn it to the ginkgo biloba fucking thing. And you're like, this is the same thing. Dum, dum, dum. You're dicing an onion of lies. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know when it, when the shift occurred. I'm not really, I don't really have a specific moment. Billy Mays, more like Billy, maybe he's lying. Oh my God, it was there in front of me the entire time. But yeah, at some point I was like, oh yeah, this this stuff is bullshit. And actually the guy, the, I forget his name, but the specific guy, he was a late night spokesperson. He was like Billy Mays, but it was, he was like a Dr. Oz type guy. Um, and he was specifically the one that hawked coral calcium. That guy's in prison. Like he got, he got like, he got like outed as like a, he was like, he was like, a, uh, you know, pushing like pseudoscience and, and, and got in trouble. Or maybe, maybe he was in prison for like fraud. I think it was fraud. At the age of 12, David had committed himself to the monastic life of being nothing but a machine, fine tuned and oiled to absorb scientific knowledge and endlessly iterate upon it until he'd made the next great scientific discovery that would revolutionize the world. However, much like his endeavors into inventing and causing local mayhem, nobody took notice. Other than his father's warm feelings about his son reading his old textbooks, he never asked about what David was doing in his bedroom, nor did anyone else. Hey, you, uh, you putting together any Christina Aguilera puzzles in there, boy? In fact, as time drew on, he became known amongst his peers as a weirdo to be avoided at all costs. Nobody took interest in his increasingly dangerous hobby, neither to encourage him to pursue it in a constructive way, or to discourage him from basically blowing himself up or otherwise disfiguring himself in increasingly bizarre ways. The best his father managed to do was realize that his increasingly reclusive son needed some kind of new outlet to socialize and work out his energy. And because Ken had been in the Boy Scouts as a child and he loved it, he figured it would be the best option to whip David into shape. Despite David's protests, Ken forced him to join Troop 371 in Clinton Township. At first, David didn't want to do it. He thought the scouts were for nerds, and he didn't exactly need any more reason for the kids at school to taunt him. Plus, he foresaw it eating into his precious laboratory time. However, upon going out on his first few scout excursions, 
he quickly realized that he actually loved it. Were you in the Scouts whenever you were a kid? I was not. No. Um, no, I, I was not. Uh, my sisters were in Girl Scouts, but I was not in Boy Scouts. Um, I feel like I went to a couple like tryout uh, scouting things, but I don't remember why I didn't like it. I, I, I don't I don't recall. Um, yeah. Repressed memories. You actually were in the scouts and you just blocked it all out. Well, honestly, I, I feel like that should have that. I feel like I would have because so I, I was I was in the scouts all through. I was in Tiger Cubs, which is the, the boy equivalent of the brownies, like there's like the introductory thing. I was in the the Weeblos, which is like the second one up. And then I was in the Boy Scouts of America for years. Um, and I. I, I I fucking hated every second of it. Well, I, I liked the Tiger Cubs and I liked a little bit of going into the Weeblos, but eventually I ended up hating it, especially whenever I got into the Boy Scouts. Um, and the reason was because so when I was in the Weeblos, our scout leader uh, was this woman who I don't remember her name at all, but her son, Ethan, was in my troop with me. And one day... During a meeting, I went to the bathroom, and when I was coming back from the bathroom, I crossed paths with this kid, Ethan, and he stopped me, and he said, he said, um, Andrew, I just wanted to let you know that none of us like you, and we wish that you weren't in the, the troop with us, and you should just tell your mom that you should quit because we all hate you. What? Yeah, like, I just, this kid, and honestly, like. Is this a bit? Was he doing a bit? No, he he just he stopped me and told me that he just everybody hated me. He just got me into a private private. He got me into private and then just told me that everybody hated me. And I've only ever heard of this happening one other time. And it was my friend Cameron in high school. He once told me that he was he had this friend who he would like hang out with all the time and he would go over to his house and they would play video games and play music together. And then one time after they'd been hanging out for years, he went over to his house and his and the kid was like, Cameron, I just have to tell you, like, I can't let this go on on, on any longer. I don't like you. I hate hanging out with you. And I wish you would just go home and never talk to me again. And then Cameron was just like, OK, and he left. That's the only other time I've ever heard of anything like this happening. Someone just like being like, you know what? This can't go on anymore. I fucking hate you. I've, I, that, but this kid did it. And to be fair, I think that the reason why he did that was because he felt threatened by me because I was new and like kids are just like fucked up. And when things change, they just like sometimes just say and do horrible things. And like, I, but yeah, he did that. Let me, let me just run this. Let me just ask this, just a clarifying question. Did you suck? At that time. No. So this dude is just the worst then. He's just the worst. Like you you didn't go in there and it was like, I don't know, like you you had a bit that you were like a running bit that everybody hated that you thought was like, a, oh, it's funny that nobody likes this bit. And everyone's like, no, just really shut up. You didn't go in there and you would like start, I don't know, spewing racial epithets or something like it's like just I, I just don't understand. I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I just don't understand how nobody would like I, like one person. They can't. There's not one of the scouts who's like this. Andrew guy is fucking cool. Well, I, I mean, well, t first of all, to be clear, I don't know if that was true. That was just him saying that. Oh, 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 oh. I'm I'm misunderstood. I misunderstood. I thought it was more like, yeah, he was just a kid saying in a hyperbolistic way, "We don't like you." Because no, he was. He was I mean, he was trying to present it like everybody. He knew that everybody hated me. Like they all talked about it and all collectively hated me. But I don't think that was actually true. I think he was lying, or maybe, or maybe he wasn't lying, and they really did hate me. I don't think that's the case. They didn't. They didn't hate you. How how could an entire group of people hate this Papa Spicy? That's not that's not happening. But but no, I mean, I I wasn't I I wasn't unlikable. I, I mean, if anything, I, well, the, here's the thing. I I was very quiet. I probably I don't. I didn't really say much. And the thing about this is a, something I've, that's followed me in my entire life. And I think anybody else will also relate to this. That's like quiet whenever you are quiet and not super uh, outgoing and like and like uh, um, extroverted. People read that as like arrogance or like you think you're better than them. But what I was going to say was that happened whenever I was in Weeblos. And then when I went into the scouts, um, that kid Ethan was also in the scouts with me. And then there was these other two kids that were these total assholes. And they were also like pathological liars. Like they would like tell us that they wrote the lyrics to Rapper's Delight, um, which obviously as an adult, I'm like, that's absurd. That's literally no way that, that could be possible. But as a kid, I was like, what? Um, and then I thought about it for a while and I was like, no, I, I think they're lying. Um, but 
I would go out. I would go out on these camping trips that were supposed to be fun, but they were just waking nightmares because these kids were just horrible to me. And it was like I was away from my parents and any of my like actual friends that I had. And I was just like out in the woods with shitty people who were mean to me. So I, I just like hated it so much. And I eventually convinced my my mom to let me quit. Um, but it's funny because despite the fact that I hated almost every second of Boy Scouts, I constantly find myself using skills that I learned in Boy Scouts as an adult. Uh, yeah, uh, I have none of those skills. <laughs> Yeah, there's I, I was we were we were we were out in the apple orchard last summer or maybe it was last fall. And uh, they were like uh, they were ter- making cider for us in this like cider churner or whatever. And then you, you had to like get this little bucket out of it and take it out and for them to pour into a little jug. And these there's like bees swarming all over these buckets. And I reached my hand down to grab the bucket and a bee stung me right on my thumb. And I'm not I'm not allergic to bees or anything like that. Like it wasn't like a dangerous situation. But if you let a bee's venom get into your hand or get into wherever you stung, your it'll it'll swell up like a fucking basketball, and it'll be like that for days, and you'll be like sore and all this stuff like that. But what you're supposed to do if you want to prevent your body from swelling up from a bee sting is you got to get it out as fast as possible. Like from the moment that you get stung, you got to get the stinger out. And also you can't squeeze it because if you squeeze the stinger, you'll you'll push the venom into your body. So you got to take your fingernails and just grab it by like the bottom and yank it out without squeezing. And I got it out really fast and my my hand did not swell and the pain it went away in like an hour or whatever. And I was like, oh, thank God. And then I was like, I learned that in the Boy Scout. Just think you could have learned how to make nuclear reactors. Yeah, almost. I was almost there. If that if that kid Ethan had just like been a little meaner. Just just like 10% more meaner. He liked the camping trips, the group activities, and the fact that since Ken had such an affection for the scouts, it was one of the only times that he would actually show an interest in David's life, frequently accompanying him to scout meetings and trips and spending some of the only quality time the two ever had together. However, the thing he really loved about Troop 371 were the merit badge challenges. He loved learning about new skills and working to earn trophies proving he'd mastered them. He found it to be just as engaging as his science experiments back home. Most of all, he loved the fact that one of the badges he could earn was in chemistry. And David realized something important. He could take advantage of Ken's nostalgia and love for the scouts in order to use his pursuit of the chemistry scout badge as a catch-all excuse to conduct all of his experiments at home. And no matter how dangerous what he was doing was, he could appeal to Ken's affections in order to explain it away. Ken thought that getting David into the scouts was a good way to distract him from his more destructive tendencies. But really, he was just opening up the floodgates. David's earliest close calls and mishaps included the time he was messing with a gas stove and it exploded, giving him second-degree burns across his arm, as well as the time he rigged a bug zapper to his home power grid in order to experiment with raising and lowering the electrical voltage in his house, and his father discovered him in his room, breathing in toxic electrical fumes being emitted from the wall outlet. He was also obsessed with trying to invent a new kind of self-tanning technology that could darken a person's skin without the need for sun because he was very concerned about getting sunburns for some reason. Once he overdosed on a chemical called canthaxanthin, which can stimulate skin pigment, and ended up going on a scout camping trip with bright orange skin and hair that didn't wear off for several days. But the danger would only get worse from here as David decided he'd outgrown his bedroom laboratory at his dad's house and expanded to a backyard potting shed at his mom's house. Between the new location and a private outdoor facility, as well as his mom and Michael's much more lax and unattentive approach to parenting, David was free to do crazier and crazier experiments in the potting shed. So what what are we looking at here, Dave? So this is a photo of young Master David standing in front of the potting shed. Uh, He's wearing shorts and a white t-shirt with what looks like some sort of crest or American flag or something on it. Um, I think it's an eagle. Um... And uh, he's got a little bottle of chemicals next to him, some rags, what looks to be an empty pool. And this, you know, he's standing in front of this uh, rundown shed and he's kind of waving to the camera, kind of like, hey, mom, what's up? Um, And uh, you can see inside the shed a little bit. And there's like newspapers on the floor and a a box. Uh, It doesn't look like he's fully moved in yet. So this must be before he set up his little laboratory back there. Yeah, it's it's funny because like it's so on it like David Hahn looks like just like he specifically reminds me of just like the jockey type guys that I went to high school with that just had like such generic interests 
that they would just like walk around wearing like gym shorts and a, and a t-shirt and they just looked like walking. Like I have nothing interesting going on about me. Like that's what they, that's what they, that's what they read visually. And he looks like that to me. He reminds me of just a random, like kind of generic dude from high school that had no real interests or passions. So it's just, it's so unassuming that you would never think this dude was doing this shit. Even more interesting, typically you'd assume that a boy with this level of interest in science was very bright. And that's not untrue. However, his level of knowledge and hunger for academics was hard concentrated in just the area of chemistry. Upon entering high school in 1990, his teachers quickly learned two things. He excelled in science, he had solid straight A's in any class related to the subject, and in class he was an active and even cocky contributor to the discussion. In fact, Ken once got a phone call from David's biology teacher, who told Ken with more amusement than annoyance that David frequently corrected her during lectures until one day she offered, half-jokingly, for David to come up to the front of the class and finish the lecture for her. He did, and enjoyed it so much that he asked if he could do it again the following week. However, despite this, the other thing his teacher learned was that anything outside of the realm of science was of almost zero interest to David, and his grades were horrible in any other subject. David was a nearly straight F student. Science and chemistry weren't just a passion for David. They were an obsession, a hyperfixation that snuffed out the oxygen for anything else going on in his life to a near debilitating degree. In fact, years later, as David's foray into nuclear experiments got more and more dangerous and started to actually pique the curiosity and concern of adults, the one thing that kept people from taking anything he was doing seriously is that when they'd read his various notes and papers on his research, David, a teenage boy, had the spelling ability of a third grader. And yet, this was the turning point when David's experiments started to go from just a danger to his own health and well-being to something that could have catastrophic effects for his entire community. So Dave, how are you feeling about the ballad of David Hahn so far? Uh, I mean, one, I'm already bracing for how depressing this is going to get. <laughs> I mean, his life is already kind of depressing, but uh, I guess it, in some ways it's both less depressing and more depressing than if he had the internet. You really got to think of like David Hahn in modern day. He's like, he's like a total like alt-right pipeline incel fucking maniac, right? Like that's 100% what he is. Speaking of all right assholes, do uh, you got anything you want to plug or places people can find you on the internet? Are you are you setting up shop on the new 8chan, Kun 4chan thing? Oh, 100%. Yeah, let, let, yeah we want to try something a little different uh, moving forward. And we're going to kind of, uh, you know, take a, take a break from the episode to kind of talk about a few of our little projects we've got going on or any kind of news going on in the Deep Cuts world um, sort of in the middle of the show. So, uh, you know, if you want to follow in the exploits of the Spapa Spice, um, you can't do that because I'm not on social media. Famously, I talk about that a lot. I, I refuse to get on social media. I have nothing going on on there. But if you want to pay your respects to the dear, departed, beloved Papa Pricey, you can go to his website, which is still up. Some mysterious donor is still paying for the hosting and the web, and the web space, uh, dapricerights.com. And on his website, you can get a couple things. You can get his, his comic, which is called Deadbull AI Private Eye. It's a uh, cyberpunk, neo-noir, sci-fi detective story about a robot detective in a future society where um, art artificial intelligence has been granted sentience and therefore human rights. And so it's basically the robots and humans kind of like um, coexisting in a future kind of dystopian society. And Deadbolt is like a classic Raymond Chandler hard-boiled detective. The book was drawn by Guillermo de Villarreal and written by Papa Pricey, and you can get it on his website. You can follow Deep Cuts on um, all of our various social media. Uh, on Facebook, we're Deep Cuts Podcast. You can also join our Facebook group. It's just called the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. It's a cool group where people hang out. There's kind of a community there. We talk about the show. We make memes. We kind of share other pop cultural stuff. Um, you can also follow us and join our Discord server. Uh, go to bit.ly.com slash deepcutsdiscord. We also have another uh, burgeoning community there where we talk about the show, make memes, play games, talk about other stuff. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at deepcutspod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. Um, and Dave, is there anything you want to plug or talk about? Uh, yeah, my book, Forest Hills Bootleg Society, is available wherever books are sold. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, local bookstores. 
Uh, we just had a French edition published. Um, that's one of the reasons why I was living in France, doing and selling books in France. That was really fun. Uh, so yeah, if you want to read some comics written by me, illustrated by Nicole Gu, centering on a group of bullied teenage girls who live in a conservative Christian boarding school in the early 2000s and start selling hentai to their classmates, you should check it out. Four Souls Bootleg Society and everything else for me, you can find at heydavebaker.com. Cool. And the la- last thing I want to talk about uh, before we go back to the show is, um, so I just want to compel our listeners to go to Apple Podcasts and give us a positive review because those help us a lot with getting um, served to people's feeds algorithmically. So uh, give us a review and let's get back to the show. Act two, doing that little scout three finger salute thing, except for your fingers are webbed. As David got into high school and had access to more advanced science classes, more expensive equipment and materials that he wasn't able to find on his own and the mentorship of a few of his teachers, David quickly absorbed more and more knowledge of chemistry. And much like every other stage of his scientific evolution, that meant more dangerous and risky acts. Once in a science class, David mixed two chemicals in an attempt to create an exothermic reaction or rapid heating. But he got the mixture wrong and the concoction quickly heated, spilled over, filled the room with toxic smoke and scorched the table. It was chaos as kids quickly ran out of the room, fearing some kind of explosion. Incidents like this led to increased isolation from his peers, being labeled as dork boy and science boy by other kids at school. Eventually he was bullied and David would often find himself getting beat up by larger boys. So what's a social outcast with an extreme interest in chemistry and science to do when he starts getting beat up at school? Did you say start hiding out in lesser traffic areas during lunch and avoiding certain routes home? No, the answer is get swole. David got his dad to buy him a weight set, and he started working out every day during the time he wasn't studying or conducting his experiments. Eventually, he built a muscular physique and started fighting back when kids would pick on him. It wasn't long until people started leaving him alone and his bullying issues completely went away. David started to slowly collect a group of friends at school who were themselves science dorks and social outcasts, and he became somewhat of their protector, making sure that other kids wouldn't mess with him under threat of getting a beatdown from Dork Boy himself. I, I just thought this was so funny. This is like one of the funniest parts of it, because like I, that's like not something you ever hear. Like I, like yeah, you get like the thing, whole thing of like if you're getting bullied, you need to stand up for yourself. But I've never heard of someone who's like this level of nerdy and like isolated and like fixated on this really like bullyable interest. And I don't mean that I think it's bullyable, but I just mean like this is the type of thing that kids would bully you for. And when he starts getting picked on, he's like, nah, I'm going to get buff. Like, and he did it too. He just, he just fucking, he put in his gains. He put in his gains and he got, he got ripped. And then he started beating the shit out of the bullies. That's like pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Also, Dork Boy is a really funny, edgy 90s, like shitty independent comic name. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And like, I thought that was funny too. Dork Boy and Science Boy. Like, if you're going to bully somebody, at least be creative. Like, Dork Boy? That's the name you came up with? Things were getting worse for David at home, though. He was becoming increasingly isolated from his father, Kathy, and his sister, Christina, in Clinton Township. And while his time at his mother's was at least bolstered by a little more love and affection, her and her boyfriend Michael's increased alcoholism and her deepening mental illness were also taking a toll on their relationship. Similar to Ken and Patty's marriage before it, Patty and Michael began to erupt into increasingly more violent fights with David frequently having to call the cops and one particularly large fight actually resulting in Patty being taken away in handcuffs. David was increasingly a stranger in a strange land. In fact, Ken started to become concerned that even the scouts weren't doing enough to get David to be more sociable and encouraged him to get an after-school job. David tried out a number of different part-time jobs, from working at McDonald's to washing dishes at a restaurant before finally settling on being a bag boy at a local Kroger's grocery store. But David was a less-than-model employee, often calling out or just not showing up for work so he could go off to his potting shed or a treehouse he built with some friends to work on more experiments in secret without his dad or Kathy finding out he was ditching work. When he was at work, he wasn't particularly committed to the job and would frequently wander off to explore the aisles of Kroger's, obsessively poring over the ingredients of the products on the shelves, memorizing their chemical makeup so he could attempt to recreate the items in his home lab. One day, another employee knocked over a large pallet of ammonia in the store. The massive amount of spilled chemical quickly sent up a large toxic cloud of fumes that spread across the entire grocery store. 
sending customers gasping for air. Some fled the store, but others were hit so hard by the fumes, which can cause blisters in the throat and sometimes even death from too much exposure, that they collapsed to the floor, unable to escape the noxious cloud. However, David happened to know the exact chemical composition of ammonia, as well as the fact that it could be neutralized using a certain type of acid. He also had an encyclopedic knowledge of most of the products in the store, as well as their chemical ingredients, and without even skipping a beat, immediately ran to the home aisle and grabbed several bottles of a specific toilet bowl cleaner he knew contained high levels of hydrochloric acid. He ran over to the ammonia spill and dumped the bottles of cleaner onto the mess, which had an immediate reaction of almost entirely neutralizing the fumes. In an instant, the overwhelming smell of ammonia completely left the grocery store, and the struggling customers were able to breathe again. David had used his chemical knowledge to save the day, and possibly a few lives. So he got a hero's welcome in the admiration of all the customers and the entire staff of Kroger's, right? No. His boss, having no idea that what David did had any correlation to the dissipation of the toxic fumes, thought he was just an idiot screwing around and making the already disastrous mess even worse, and fired him on the spot. David turned in his apron and left the Kroger's in defeat. Even when his specific obsession could be a force for good, people still didn't understand. They still saw him as some kind of outcast or freak. Luckily, another employee called Poison Control to ask what they needed to do to clean up the mess, and the person on the phone literally told them to go and dump the exact toilet bowl cleaner David had used on the spill. Realizing that David had actually done the right thing, the manager called him up and begrudgingly offered him his job back, still kind of thinking he was a bit of an oddball and never offering him any kind of thanks. Rather than a sincere apology and show of gratitude, the manager's call to David was more of a, eh, no harm, no foul, I guess, type situation. This 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 part like really hit me hard because it's like it's it's a reminder of the fact that like people in broad civilized society are so averse to anything being weird or against the status quo that even when it's objectively good, they're still like they would almost rather David have not saved people because the fact that he did it was weird. You know, do you, do you, like, do you, are you getting what I'm saying? Does that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, and also the fact that, you know, science uh, and math in our culture, you know, all the STEM programs are just so misunderstood and not comprehended and not taught and not learned in schools. You know, like obviously STEM STEM classes uh, should be a vital part of our kind of cultural ecosystem, but they're just kind of not for like most people. Yeah. To the point where like most people don't think about them at all. When they do think about them, they're thought of as like something that you shouldn't trust because it's because it's like elitist people that you don't understand. But but just the idea that like they wouldn't be like, holy shit, like you fucking saved these people. You saved us from like a massive lawsuit. You are a hero. Like here's a medal or something like that. Instead, they're just like, uh, like, thanks, I guess. You make weird jokes, bro. Yeah, like just they're, they're just so averse to something being off kilter or against the status quo that like even when it, they, he like fucking saves lives, they're still just like off put by it. It reminds me of like that thing that happens whenever somebody comes up to you, they ask you a question about something and you give them the answer. And because the answer is not what they wanted it to be or is like a little long winded or you had like a very specific thought about it that they just weren't expecting like they ask you you answer their question that they asked you and then they act like why did you just tell me that yeah i, I don't know that i've ever gotten that that reaction before oh i i got i get that all the time people people ask me something and i answer their question and then they're just like they act like it's like like i just thrust something upon them that they that they didn't want <laughs> Around this time, having filled out to a lean five foot nine with what people described as a winning smile, David had his first luck in the romance department and started dating a fellow student at his high school named Heather. And while in nearly every other area of his life besides science, David was woefully incompetent and disengaged, he actually took being a boyfriend very seriously. The couple soon became inseparable and David entered a phase where he could actually decouple from his scientific pursuits for a while and focus on being loving, caring, and thoughtful to Heather. Heather was also smitten with David, but much like everybody else in his life, had little interest in his chemistry hobby. 
Though he was much more engaged with their relationship than anything else going on in his life, he still often found himself info-dumping to Heather about his latest scientific experiments. But all she gave him was a supportive, if not ambivalent, uh-huh, great. Once Heather started taking David home to meet her mom, she also similarly thought he was a sweet, caring boy, but didn't really know what to make of his scientific obsession. When he'd go to their house for dinner, he'd spend the entire evening ranting about the chemical composition of the food they were eating. And any time the family tried to change the subject and talk about sports or current events, he had a strange talent for immediately shifting the topic back to science. Heather's mom, Donna, liked David and certainly felt he was a better choice of a boyfriend than some of the other boys, but she was also confused by him. Once, Donna invited David to be a guest at her second wedding to Heather's new stepdad, Alan, but she strictly instructed him to not talk to anybody. He was allowed to just eat and keep to himself. The family's general positive opinion on David started to slowly shift, however, on the night that Heather received an emergency phone call from him. He was at home and told her that there had been an explosion that had left him with several burns all over his body. Alan and Heather rushed over to David's house in Clinton Township to check on him, assuming that there had been some kind of gas leak or an appliance in his house that had blown up, only to discover that the explosion had been as a result of one of his failed science experiments. Even Heather hadn't been fully aware that the types of things David was doing were this dangerous. Even worse, Ken arrived home around the same time that Alan and Heather showed up, and his behavior shocked them. Ken casually strolled into the house and checked on David in a nonchalant way. When he discovered that David's burns were relatively minor and nothing in the house had been too badly damaged, he just casually strolled into the kitchen to make himself a sandwich, barely even acknowledging the presence of Alan and Heather. After this incident, Heather's mom Donna took her aside and expressed concern for the first time about whether or not it was a good idea to be dating David. Heather shrugged off her mother's concerns, but from that day on, David wasn't allowed to talk about his experiments in front of her parents. And when he'd get too far off on one of his lectures when they were alone together, she'd give him that concerned, tight-lipped smile and he'd know to change the subject. Without even his loving girlfriend to confide in, David's experiments and research became stranger and more obsessive. During one of his many excursions into sunless skin tanning, he discovered a hormone that could stimulate melanin in the skin and cause natural skin darkening. But the hormone could only be found in the pituitary gland of a cow. So naturally, he went to a local slaughterhouse, greased the palm of one of the employees, and started buying freshly severed cow skulls off of him for 10 bucks a pop so he could harvest the hormone. You know, regular stuff a teenage boy gets into. <laughs> it's like... It's it's fucking metal, man. It's fucking metal. Like, there's some crazy shit that David Hahn did, and there's some sad stuff that David Hahn did, and there's some tragic stuff that David Hahn did, but the f most metal thing that he did was that he was like, I need this one thing, and it can only be found in cow skulls. So I'm just going to go and buy cow skulls from a slaughterhouse and just keep them in my shed. The thing, too, is like, you know, saying, oh, yeah, he went to a slaughterhouse and then greased somebody's palm is like, yeah, but how? Like, how do you, what do you say to that guy? Just on a, like, ones and zeros level, like, excuse me, sir, I would like a cow skull? Why? What are you going to do with it? Well, pituitary glands. <laughs> you know, like, what do you tell that guy? Well, here's the thing. I don't know because the research doesn't really, like, you really, you have no idea what these, what these day-to-day -day conversations are like. Like, it's one of those things where the story is very fascinating and there's a lot of detail to it because he had somebody sort of like interview him and write a book about him and interview all these different people. So there's a lot of detail, but you just love to be a fly on the wall for some of these things that are described where it's like, what literally was that like? What was that conversation? And to in the answer to your question, I have no fucking idea. But what I do know is, and as we'll learn more and more of, David was like, he was like, the, he was like amazing at negotiating. Like he could just convince somebody to give him something. And I don't know how, I don't know what he said, but he could just, he could just go to any person and convince them to give him some crazy shit. Like, do you think he lies? Do you think he goes in there and he's like, oh, my family has a rich tradition of making cow skull soup. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely lying. Like he would tell, he would go and he would tell people that it was for a scout project or he would as we'll learn he literally would like pose as a college professor and like mail send letters to people and be like I'm a college professor and I need this or whatever like he definitely lied and made up fake stories to justify it but like I just don't know what like when he would because he would like ostensibly he just like walked into the slaughterhouse and started talking to somebody and like how did th how did that go what did he say that's what I that's what I would like to know I would like to be a flaw in the wall for that conversation for sure David started experimenting with the hormone by scraping off large chunks of his skin with a knife and observing how it reacted with the hormone, which he isolated from the pituitary gland by using a solution of potassium chloride and carboxylic acid, 
which he obtained by mail order. And apparently the results were actually promising according to David. And while you might view a teenage boy obsessed with becoming a famous scientist with almost no formal training and unreliable narrator, the most surprising thing about this is that David's experiments, which he was developing independently based on his studies of chemical compositions and their effects on skin darkening, actually paralleled the real research into sunless tanning that was going on at legitimate research firms at the time in US and Australia, which because it was the early 1990s and the internet wasn't really a thing that was widely available, David could really have no way of knowing. By 2001, the FDA had already started to approve treatments and drugs that use this exact method for sunless tanning and they are still used to this day. And while his own research had nothing to do with the actual methods and drugs that ended up being developed and approved nationally, David, this 15-year-old boy who taught himself chemistry from a children's book published in the 1960s, had independently made the exact same discovery. He was just a lonely, isolated child who nobody gave a shit about, and so nobody knew about it. And the weirder his experiments got, the more he pushed his friends and family away, and the more isolated he became. Even Heather, who had no intention of breaking up with David, just ultimately wanted to wash her hands of that side of his life. One time, he convinced her to come with him to his mom's house so he could show her his potting shed lab for the first time. Upon arriving, David discovered that some of his chemicals had gotten mixed together and caused an explosion inside the shed. And as luck would have it, a raccoon had gotten into the shed and was poking around at the time, so it got completely mutilated by the explosion. That was enough for Heather, and she never returned to the potting shed. David's experiments were now strictly a taboo subject between them. Like, dude dude, like took his girlfriend to his house for the first time, and there was just like an exploded raccoon. Dude, amazing. Amazing vibes. <laughs> like, I feel like that's not, like, it's probably, it's probably helped that they had been already going out for a while, so they'd built a rapport. But, like, I feel like if I, if I was, like, dating a girl and I took her to my house and I was like, oh, I accidentally exploded a raccoon, like, that would have been a deal breaker. <laughs> like, that would have, like, I'm already, I'm already white knuckling this right now. I'm we're already trying really hard to get girls to like me enough to want to date me. Like, exploded raccoons in my house that's that's not I'm not gonna come back from that. I'm not recovering from that. I'm raccoon boy. Like I I got I got dumped by one of my high school girlfriends because I didn't dance enough at a at a at a school dance. I mean, that's understandable. But I'm just saying, like, that's that's the I mean, I've almost stopped being friends with you like like five times because you don't dance enough. And yet you would if I if you came over to my house and there was just like an exploded raccoon in my garage and I was like, whoops, I, I left a fucking smoke bomb out that like you would be fine with that. Yeah, no problem. So no lack of dancing is like a no a non star. It's, it's a deal breaker. Frankenstein's monster-esque experiments that cause like the graphic mutilation of a raccoon is like kosher. Yeah, I'm like, oh, you're you're, you're in your Frankenstein era. Great. That's, that, that's what you say. <laughs> if you saw that, you'd be like, you'd be like, I like it. You're in your Frankenstein era. It's <laughs> it's it's giving Mary Shelley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always knew you had a Colin Clive look about you. <laughs> Well, good to know. Good to know. Ken and Kathy were pushing him further and further away as well. Back home in Clinton Township, they decided they had enough of the constant explosions, smoke, and smells coming from David's bedroom and ordered him to move his lab to the basement, which delighted David. He moved his entire room downstairs and felt liberated to do absolutely anything he wanted with very little fear of getting in trouble. But with the liberation came even more explosions, smoke, and weird smells. The increased freedom of the basement only made things worse in the Han household. And even in the cloudy haze of his obsession with his work, Ken was starting to finally realize there might be a genuine problem. One night while Ken and Kathy sat watching TV in the living room, the house was rocked by yet another loud explosion. They ran downstairs to find David lying flat on his back, unconscious, with his eyebrows singed off. He had been hammering a piece of red phosphorus inside of a plastic container and it exploded. His father rushed him to the hospital where they removed the plastic shards. And for months after the incident, he went to several checkup appointments where they continued to find and remove additional pieces. He had impaired vision for a full year. Ken finally took David to a doctor, thinking he may have ADHD or some other type of focus issues causing him to obsess over this one specific hobby and letting every other aspect of his life crumble to pieces. But the doctor told him that wasn't the problem. In fact, after extensive tests, they had no idea what was wrong with David, if anything was. Much like what had happened to Andrew WK when he was taken to therapy as a child, the doctor basically shrugged his shoulders and concluded that David had a devilish side which was no help to Ken. 
And you know, this part here, like reading this whole thing, the fact that they took him to a doctor and had him tested for ADHD and they were like, or I guess in the 90s it would have been called ADD. Um, and they were like, nah, he doesn't have ADD. Like, I don't think that was true. I think he did. Like, I think they gave him a bad diagnosis. This sounds to me like he does have ADHD, like 100%. Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously not a doctor, but the it sounds like it to me. <laughs> so he was just like, failed by every single adult in his life because he, all these parents and adults that just like didn't pay attention, didn't care, didn't realize the severity of what was going on. And then they went to a doctor finally. And the doctor was like, no, nah, I don't know what's wrong with him. Give him some milk. He just, he was just fucked. Give the nerd boy some milk. <laughs> he, the doctor also calls him dork boy. You want some fucking milk science boy? It's like, Hey dork boy. It's like, how do you know about my nickname? Oh, uh, my, my son is, is Leroy, your school bully. And he tells me about his exploits of beating the shit out of you. And I laugh and laugh. So anyway, nothing wrong with you. You're just being a pussy. And Kathy had had enough after that final basement explosion. She told David that he was no longer allowed to conduct his experiments in the house and told Ken that if David didn't obey, she was moving out. Ken cracked down on David. He started following him around, suspicious that he wasn't actually going to study at the library like he said he was. For a time, he thought he might be using his chemical skills to sell drugs. However, he always found David exactly where he said he'd be, sitting at the library buried in a pile of chemistry books, which, if anything, may have actually been the worst case scenario for the exasperated Ken. He stopped letting David stay at home by himself for any length of time for fear he might sneak in one of his patented experiments. Even when he would run to the store for a couple minutes, David had to come. With his ability to experiment in the Han household waylaid, David shifted his base of operations primarily to the potting shed at his mom's house. But he also brought his particular brand of chemical destruction out into the serenity of nature. One summer, while at camp, David had smuggled in some powdered magnesium, and he and some friends accidentally blew the top off their tent after igniting it. Then he was caught making homemade moonshine at the request of some older camp counselors. The moonshine was a modified version of a recipe for ethanol he had found in the Golden Book. Yes, David literally made moonshine. Like, this shit, this is badass. L l dare I say, this is badass. Dude, <laughs> dude's like har harvesting cow heads and making moonshine. Yeah, it's really, he He sounds like a pulp adventure kid. Like, he sounds like what they write. He's like Alan like Quarterman. Swift. Yes, yes, he's Alan Quartermain Jr., the new series of young adult novels coming from Parker Brooks this summer. I, I mean, seriously, like, if, like the exploits of, like, Tom Swift Jr. or any of these characters, like, he, I think, actually tops them. Like, the shit he was doing was crazier. It's crazier, but also he doesn't have a fucking, like, flying car. Yeah, he wasn't going on, he wasn't, like, he wasn't going on the adventure aspect of it where he was actually like, fighting bad guys. But the things he were doing were more was more extreme. But how crazy would it be if you found out that like he actually was fighting bad guys? Like there was some some dude who was just like fucking the cow skulls, and that's why he went there to get them. That's the reality of the story. Like what we know of it is that there was this tragic boy who had this obsession, and it ended up kind of destroying him. But in reality, what was happening was that he was like an actual like Hardy Boys esque like superhero adventurer. And he was like saving the world constantly, but like just nobody knew knows. And it's all just it all happened in private and we just don't know about it. And this was just kind of like the, the public story that was told. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the like men in black cover up story. I love to believe that over the real story because as fascinating as it is, it's also very sad. He was kicked out of the camp. Ken was at his wit's end. He didn't know what else to do to straighten David up. The last thing he could think of was that maybe the scouts were his way out of all of this. It was the one interest that Ken and David shared. Ken loved the scouts growing up and David had been in them for a few years and seemed to have taken it seriously and gotten really into all the camping trips and badge earning. Maybe if he could just motivate David to pursue the scouts further, he could break him of his obsession with blowing stuff up. Little did Ken know that David had been contemplating quitting his troop because it was taking up too much of his time he could spend mixing chemicals. But either way, instead of, you know, talking to David like at all about his interests, why he was interested in chemistry, what he was doing, what he was trying to accomplish, how Ken and the rest of his family could help him pursue these passions in a safer, less volatile way. Instead, Ken just wanted to push him further away from it, ignore it, distract from it, win by attrition rather than have a genuine heart-to-heart -heart conversation with his own son. So one day, Ken sat David down and talked to him about achieving the ultimate goal, attaining his Eagle Scout status. Little did he know, it'd be the worst mistake he could make. The strange and tragic story of the radioactive Boy Scout is only just beginning. As he enters into the Boy Scouts, he'll soon develop a passion for atomic energy, 
and eventually David Hahn will settle on the ultimate goal of building a nuclear reactor. Find out the rest of the story next week in part two of David Hahn, Radioactive Boy Scout. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by D. Catalano, whose music can be found at wekeepoddhours.bandcamp.com.